Hello everyone, how are you all today? I hope you're well. I don't know if you're going to be able to tell from the picture, but we've got a beautifully bright day in London here today. Um, now you might think, why don't you race off to the garden then, Vivi? <laughs> because I'm behind with indoor jobs and I'm determined to crack on. Before I even start, I've just found something out that's fantastic. <laughs> Such a revelation to me. My washing machine has got a pause button. Who knew? You probably all knew that, didn't you? I didn't. So because um, I try to only use the washing machine once a week, last week I did a load of, I did a big load that was all stuff either for the shop, linens for the shop, and or bits of fabric I wanted to wash, to then press, to then so into things. Anyway, so I thought, well, it's such a gorgeous day. It's warm. I'll make the most of it. I'll put my clothes in the washing machine because there's a big pile of them uh, because I air dry everything indoors. It's so wonderfully warm today. I thought, yeah, what a good idea. Start the washing machine. And then I thought, oh no, because I want to film now and it's so noisy. Anyway, it's got a pause button. So it's on pause must not forget to unpause. Right, enough of that. So, one of the jobs I've been wanting to do for ages, um, really started to think about it last September, October, when I was doing the harvest, is to crack on with making some lavender bags to put in my shop. So, um, obviously I harvested the lavender, I left it to dry, then <laughs> went through that laborious process of getting them all off their stalks. My goodness, that was a beautiful afternoon on the sofa, the smell. Mm -mm -mm. I know there are a couple of you out there who don't like the smell. Actually, <coughs> excuse me, just gulped. Bearing that in mind, I might do a couple of rosemary bags as well as lavender bags for those who don't like lavender because rosemary is also quite a good insect repellent in your underwear drawer. So I've been wanting to get on with these lavender bags for ages, just other things have been in the way. Now I could make them very simply, a, well a rectangle of fabric, fold it in half, seam around three sides, get the lavender in, obviously before I finish it off, boom, done. But I wanted to make them a little bit more special than that um, because obviously I want to sell them. And also I just like making things a bit more special. So I decided that I would patchwork them. So what I'm gonna show you shortly is my normal way of patchworking that I've been doing for years. Let me show you an example. Here's a nine put together. Can you hear it's crinkly, crinkly? So this, I, when I'm patchworking, I use the English paper piecing method. So you can see this paper in there. I'll come on to that in a second because I'm going to show you how I do that today. That's obviously quite a time consuming way of making patchwork. And it simply wouldn't be commercially viable because, you know, each bag could end up taking me two hours to make if I did it that way. And if I was charging the national minimum wage, which is about, I don't know, it's about nine pounds an hour, that'd be 18 pounds for my time, plus a couple of quid for materials. <laughs> you know, it's just not viable. So I'm going to have a go at machine patching. I haven't machine patched for years and years. Um, I've only ever done it once. Um, a friend wanted a patchwork cushion for their brand new cottage. My plan had been to hand patch it, but then I was invited to that cottage for a sort of housewarming weekend, way before I could sit down and hand sew. So I did machine patch and it turned out beautifully. Uh, it's just, you know, it's it's a different ball game, isn't it? Hand sewing versus machine sewing. So, ah, oh, patchwork. Love, love, love it. Now, I've got here, I'm going to bring you in close in a minute when I start working, but some, I mean, truly, truly beautiful fabrics. And I'm just starting to group them together. How can I show you this? In sort of 
Oh, it's going to be tricky. In colour families. You see, you see that sort of pink is in a sort of a, a sort of slubby lime green. There's, oh, I love these two together. I absolutely adore these two together. I'm going to call this one Regency. Can you see? Oh, beautiful. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. One of the reasons I want to do these as patchworks is some of these fabrics are ridiculously expensive. <laughs> I have very expensive taste. So I'm sure any of you out there who sew will know of, for example, Liberty, Liberties of London. I adore their fabrics. Um, these, for example, are Tilda. They're a pair of Tilda fabrics. Any of you who use Tilda fabrics will instantly recognise those as being Tilda. I think, I think those two are Tilda as well. What I love about Tilda is each season when they bring out a new range, I think this was from the range, I think it was simply called Garden. <laughs> you can imagine why I bought it. Um, but then they do, you know, all sorts of colours. Look at those two together, beautiful. Yeah, what I love about them each, each season when they bring out a new range of fabrics, all of them tonally work together. So look, I've got expensive taste whether it's Tilda, Liberty, I've got some bits and bobs in here of Kath Kidston from over the years, although I'm kind of moving away from that as I think it's becoming a bit too common. I mean, I still really like it, but one tends to see it everywhere. So, you know, when we're talking 20 pounds a metre for fabric, every little scrap one wants to make the most of. And also because they're so beautiful, I don't want to put these scraps in the bin. So doing a patchwork, it's a great way to use up your scraps, um, especially if you're making it for yourself and keeping it. What a gorgeous thing, whether it's a cushion or maybe um, a cotton shopping bag. I'm going to do some patchwork cotton shopping bags too, to have all these different fabrics in that all represent, oh, that was the dress I made for my neighbour's daughter. Oh, that was the top I made for myself last summer. It's just lovely, isn't it? It's like a sort of a memory board, as it were, as well as just being beautiful of itself. The other thing I love about patching is, it's just, it's the colours, it's the, it's the thing I love about working with fabric full stop. For me, it's, I'm painting, I'm painting again. I used to paint. I don't have the space or the time anymore to paint. Boo-hoo. I mean, I, I'm sure you all know this by now. I did a combined degree originally in drama and fine art. Then I went to drama school and pursued the drama rather than the art. But yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's like this beautiful box of colours. And the lovely thing about with patches is I can continually move them around and, and, and get it exactly where two pieces of fabric butt up to each other and sing because they're so gorgeous together. Um, yeah, you know that I, I, I have so much joy making the bunting, going and finding fabrics. And quite often what happens is I might have one or two fabrics that have got together and I think, they'll be beautiful in a bunting but it needs a third thing and a third colour or design and it doesn't always happen straight away so with some of the buntings I've made already some of that fabric I've had 10 years some of it I've had two years some of it I've had a week where I've gone out and I've I've seen either a, a length of vintage fabric scrap being sold off or I've gone to my favourite fa favourite fabric shop with my other two bits in my hand to to play and match up. Oh, love it, love it, love it. So, patching, great for using up your scraps, especially when you've got your expensive fabrics. Wonderful creative process of playing with the colours and essentially we're getting something for free apart from our time. Oh, and on that note as well, to mention thread, as you'll see 
when we come to I'll show you this one for example you see where I've basted that one it's quite um it's quite a sort of a, a bright but dark green that's not a thread color I would use very often at all my palette tends to be within the sort of blues and pinks with little pops of say lilacs greens that sort of thing so it's a great way to use up bits of thread too anyone who's a machine sewer will know this there's always that little bit of thread left on the bobbin which is too short to do the job so how many times have we all pulled off maybe 50 centimeters that's left on the bobbin what do you do with it here's my little trick and tip for your leftover bobbin bits bit of cardboard and then along the edges a few snips not deep snips and then on the other side corresponding snips I need a bit of fabric now to show you with and I'll use this because I will use it up later so say that's our little bit of leftover from the bobbin so on this card, can you see, I've just made a little slit that side, a little slit that side, is that going to show up? And then simply, <clears throat> when my bobbin is sort of, this is so hard to show upside down, sort of finished but not quite, as in there's a length that's long enough to use, I then just wrap it around my piece of card like this. I have got one of these, well, I've got about four bits of these cards in my sewing box, but I just thought I'd show you on a new piece. So then, yeah, is that going to pick up? So you can see, look, I've just saved, that's about 50 centimetres of thread. Like I said, if you're machine sewing, whatever you're sh sewing, um, there's nothing more annoying than seeing if the bobbin will just do and you get halfway down the length of the seam and the bobbin runs out it's so frustrating and annoying so <clears throat> just pull it off the bobbin and stick it on a piece of card it won't be wasted you can use it for your little teeny tiny hand sewing projects right so today <clears throat> it's gonna be the day no don't start singing vivi um just going to move some of this fabric out of the way. I'm just going to talk to you quickly about my equipment and then I'm going to bring you in and show you how I do things. I should just say as well that there are bound to be people out there who do a lot more of this than me and are a lot more expert than me. Like everything I do, <laughs> And whether it's in my TIY section, garn section, I'm not an expert in any of these things, not at all. What I am is someone who is happy to have a go and become adept enough at doing it that I can come up with a satisfying product. So other people may do it a little bit differently, other people may do it better than me, but I want to show you this to show that pretty much anyone can have a go. Right, so, I just showed you one of my little blocks of nine. Obviously there are all sorts of patterns, all sorts of shapes you can use for patchwork. I go for the squares because it's so simple and straightforward. My plan is, I build up my squares of nine to start with, so I've got different different patterns here, different again. And then eventually I will make my bedspread by, there'll be gaps between, <laughs> there'll be gaps between each block of nine. I'm trying to show you a gap. I'll do it with two. So that I will end up with one, two, three, four, five going across and seven going up. Probably it might be six and eight. And then between between the blocks that way and between the blocks that way, I will just go for a much more simple, a white-ish pattern, something with a white background. Doing it this way, I find that then 
once I've got all my blocks of nine made up, I can just move them around to see where they will best sort of sit next to each other. So the English paper piecing method, essentially what we're doing is, I'll just show on the back of this one that's you know, near made up. I don't know why, I must have been showing this to someone else, but I don't know why I've put a plain piece here. Never mind. We pop the paper in and stitch the fabric to the paper just to hold the shape whilst we then get on and sew the whole thing together. Ah, uh, that's quite a good one for showing my stitches because it's a white thread on a red background. So you will need templates. These are, they're plastic. They're not single use plastic, it's okay. So I've got a larger one for my fabric. So then I cut around it and I get my fabric. And then I've got the smaller one to cut around my paper. So that eventually, that's the right side of the fabric, wrong side. You can see how the paper, I can't see proper what I'm doing, but you can get an idea. It's gonna sit in the middle of the fabric. The fabric is going to be folded and basted all the way around. I'll show you that a bit more closely in a second. So you've got your templates. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. I like this size. It's fairly quick and easy to work. I was thinking the other day though that sometimes my scraps are a bit too small for this. So when I bought my, oops, these are my patchwork, what's it called them? Look, I bought a set of these years ago. You get all sorts of shapes in there, can you see? The vast majority of these I don't use, so they've been sat in their paper bag for about 30 years. Peter Jones on Sloane Square. That haberdashery department was my favourite. Yeah, but what I was thinking, actually, I was just going through these, because as I say, I haven't touched the rest of them for years. So actually, that's quite tiny. Um, so even the tiniest scrap I could make something from. However, <laughs> I wouldn't be making a bedspread from pieces that small, because that would seriously, I mean, as it is, this has taken me years to get this far, because I don't do it very often. And I keep joking that actually at the rate I'm sewing, it is going to be my shroud and not my um, quilt. So you've got your templates. This is my other favorite, favorite tool. I've only had this about two years. It's a rotary cutter. So you can see inside, this is a sharp, a circular blade. <clears throat> and what it means is you can have a stack of say three or four fabrics and cut them all out at the same time using your template as opposed to what I used to do was put the template on the fabric, tailor's chalk, mark around it and then hand cut every single piece. Can you imagine it? Crazy. I don't use my rotary cutter when I'm cutting my paper because that will blunt it instantly. I've also got on the table, can you see the green? That's my cutting mat. <clears throat> One of these days, I will have a lovely big table and a lovely big cutting mat, but never mind. So, you've got your shapes, you've got your rotary cutter and your mat to cut your fabric out. You basically end up with a load of, piece of fab pieces of fabric like this, a pile of squares of paper like this, I'm not going to show you this bit, but then, actually, do you know what? I'm going to bring you in a little bit closer because I want to show you how things are stitched together. That's a bit better now we can see. So I've got here my stack of um, squares which have already been put together. You can see the all sorts of different colourways. I'm not much of a fan of yellows. I'm going to set those aside. I don't know what I'll do with them, but I had the scraps, so I thought, well, tsh, I might as well just pop them onto papers. Something will happen. This, These two little tiny bits of fabric I've actually joined together on the machine. 
I adored these two fabrics so much and they were from a little summer dress I made for a friend's kid years ago and I just couldn't bear to part with them. That's what I mean about patchworks being sort of like a memory board. So although I've, I've machine stitched these two pieces together, they will basically be hand sewn into the quilt like everything else. Right, anyway, so yes, all sorts of squares, patterns, whatever to choose from, all sorts of previous projects are represented here. Oh, I love that one as well, that's a Laura Ashley, but it's such beautiful witch colours, isn't it? Sort of peacock colours. So, in terms of, I'm not going to show you putting the paper the cloth and the paper together you can see it's a really scruffy basting stitch that's all it is quick sticks what you might call you might call it tacking or basting whatever you call it but what I find helps is once they've all been basted together uh, I'll just do a stack of them at the, at the same time is I'll quickly press them so that all these you can see what that little corner is folded over just to get everything really flat and even done and then hand sewing needle selection I've got to show you this I love it this is a little needle book that my grandma made for me when I was about I don't know six so I'm sure we all have a favorite little needle book there's all sorts of needles bodkins in here I'm sure probably you are similar to me in that you have a favourite needle for hand sewing. Mine is here, ready threaded. It's tiny. Look how tiny it is. It's really, are you going to be able to see that? It's a really, really fine needle. I am going to be making quite small stitches and also these fabrics, they're, they're sort of dress weight uh, cottons rather than say a more like an upholstery weight cotton so I want to use a finer needle because I don't want to make great gaping holes in my work with the needle I am struggling these days to thread this <laughs> because the eye is well let's just say the eye is about the thickness of <laughs> the thread so let's pop these out of the way again I'm going to grab one of these to match up. So, here's one I've already started. So this is obviously my choice for the centre. And I've got some more of this fabric cut, but not basted onto paper yet. And so what will happen is, I'm going to join this one today. It's going to be a bit of a mismatched block, but then this pattern I'll repeat in the four corners. So I like to start in the middle, get the four opposing colours on, and then I know exactly where I'm going to put my corners. So, very simply, let's see if I can show you on here already. Is that going to pick up? It's going to struggle to pick up. Can you see? Myriad teeny tiny stitches I wonder if it will show up better on this side oh, I don't know if you can just pick them up teeny teeny tiny so I don't want to make great galumphing stitches in this because I, I want once I've stitched it I want it to open flat and to lay flat and I don't really want the stitches to be visible from the top side of the quilt so Teeny tiny stitches. Now, I've never been any good at making a knot. I've never managed it. So before I even get this piece, I'm just gonna anchor my thread into this square here. Work a single thread. Again, I don't want a massive bulk from working with the double thread. It's it looks partly like it's double just because I've given myself too long a piece and I don't want it to knot. So I've just passed that through two times. Gosh, can you see two times there? 
leave a loop, pass my needle through the loop, come back up and that effectively anchors it. So, this is the back side, this is the new piece. So right sides together. So on the inside, that's the right side. And then very simply, oh, there's a cat hair on there. Where's that come from? Just get it properly snuggled up. And then very simply, use a whip stitch. So with the whip stitch, gosh, it's going to be hard to show you. It's, you're passing through, I'm going, so my thread is anchored on, we'll call this the blue side and this the red side. So my thread is anchored into that blue side. So I'm going to come over the top and just pick up the tiniest amount of fabric in the red side, straight through to the blue side again, come through. There we go. So it's come through the blue side, I'm coming back across the top. I could do with showing you this on a massive scale with opposite colour threads, couldn't I? Through the blue side, over the top, down into the red side, straight through. So when I go straight through each time, I'm actually catching the tiniest amount of paper at the same time. And so on and so on until I've done that whole edge and then I can start on my next square. <laughs> I thought this would be a bit easier to show you but it's proving a bit tricky. There we go. I've probably got slightly too long a thread to be working with today because it is tangling and catching but you see it literally the thread is coming over the top of, so if this is sideways on the needle is coming out of this side I'm coming back over the top into the red side straight through the red and the blue needle comes out and comes right back over the top into the red side again and like I said it's just catching the tiniest amount of fabric Shop on there, I don't know. So, carry on doing that until you've done 10,000 of them <laughs> and you're, you're ready to assemble all your, your, your blocks. Let's just pop that a little bit further out of the way so I don't knock it flying. Let's pretend that I'm not going to have another colour in between. Just to demonstrate what I was trying to say earlier is imagine we're working something like this and there'll be a white or maybe a pale blue <clears throat> all the way through and around each block but just for demonstration purposes and let's use this one because it's one of my favorite fabrics it's that gorgeous Laura Ashley one it's so bright and beautiful actually this is Laura Ashley too so obviously you've, you've made all your blocks and you start to surround them. So in this case, I would be doing a whip stitch all the way along there, all the way along. Eventually, your whole quilt has been put together. And then comes the really fun part of removing the papers. What I would say as well is once the whole quilt is put together, before you take the papers out, give it another pressing just to make sure it's all nice and beautifully neat. So when you come to take the papers out, oh, I've done one here. I've obviously been demonstrating to another friend. Can you see there's no paper in the middle of that one? Actually, I don't want to do it on an outside edge on here because I want, I want to keep these outside edge ones in for when I'm joining them up to the whites. So I'll show you one here. So we've got this paper in the middle. I'm simply, I can't see where I started stitching, but I'm simply going to snip out. Is that the one? My basting stitch. If you've got a quick on picker seam ripper, 
would obviously be easier but I have my snips to hand so they will do oh, such a satisfying moment is that stitch right there and then quite simply so now all the basting stitches are out get to pull out the paper I don't know if this will pick up either but does it show all around the edge here? Can you see it? Looks, it's ever so slightly serrated. That's all my little teeny tiny stitches which previously went in. So yeah, that's the that's the pretty much last process. Once the whole top of your quilt is put together, all the papers come out. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. And then it's up to you what you want to do in terms of whether you want to put any wadding in or whether you just want it as a single layer get your backing on <laughs> get quilting get putting your binding on easy I'll have it done in a week or so yay <laughs> it's so lovely to have all this fabric out and be playing again um, I am going to now put my hand patching away and start on the machine stuff because I need to get that into the shop but I hope that's given you a little idea of English paper piecing. Um, I know, like I said, there are all sorts of ways of patching. And what I love is it's one of those things that can be quite regional. So I know that in different parts of the world, we all patch differently. The actual designs of how you put the patches together. There are so many beautiful patterns. And again, they can be quite regional too. I know, for instance, in the States at least, there are groups, quilting circles, where you get together and you, you're you doing your patching or the quilting part um, as a group. How lovely. If you've never, ever patched before, give it a go. It's great. And it's one of those things where... You know, if you're just beginning to get into dressmaking or, or perhaps you've had a go at making some curtains or a cushion for your house and you're still quite a nervous stitcher, whether on the machine or by hand, you've probably got some of those bits and bobs of scraps left over. Get them together, cut them out into whatever shape is your preferred shape. I'd suggest that the squares and the blocks of nine are probably the easiest way to start but yeah have a go try it yourself yay waste not want not let's not chuck any scraps away and let's make really beautiful things for our homes and actually beautiful things which could become an heirloom within the family how wonderful the idea i know some of you are recently newish mums how wonderful to start working on something if you can get a moment. <laughs> I know if you're a new mum, it's kind of like that doesn't work, does it? New mum sitting down to do patchworking. You know what I mean? When the kids have gone to bed and you want to relax, make a couple of squares up and then one day, who knows, maybe your kids will be passing that quilt down onto their children. I can't think of anything lovelier. And actually, talking of that whole thing of memory, I think one of the really, really lovely things to do with patches is, I've done this once for a really good friend. It's a bit of a scary responsibility, but memory patchworks in memory of a lost loved one. So the one I did for a friend of mine was for her, in memory of her granddad. And she gave me a selection of his old shirts, which, and this is what I mean, it's a bit of responsibility when it's someone else's, but I cut those up and made, it's quite a small, actually really quite a small quilt, more like a pram quilt, of those patches for her to give to her kid, who was still quite a baby at the time, so wouldn't actually know that grandfather growing up. So that's a really nice thing. Or, for instance, um, Let's say you've got kids who are now, say, five and seven years old and willing to bet you've probably got boxes and boxes of their baby clothes in the attic. Now, first of all, I would suggest that you share those with a charity shop, a refuge centre, whatever. But if there are a few that are really, really special, maybe cut them up 
to make a little cushion or something from them, a little patchwork cushion with your, maybe a cushion for each kid using each of their different clothes. Lovely. Right, well on that note, I need to get my sewing machine out and get working on these. Oh, 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 just gotta show you one more time. <sighs> Achingly beautiful fabrics. So that's me sorted for the rest of the day. I hope that's made you feel a bit inspired to get stuck into a fabric project. I do hope so. If you do, share your pictures with me on Facebook because I'd love to see them. But until then, it's cheerio for now and I will see you again soon, hopefully in the garden. Bye for now.